Hey everyone, welcome to Homes for Beginners. This is the first video of the Garage Series project we will be building. I'll be going through the process, everything that is required from start to finish. This is being built in Ontario, Canada. Some of the requirements and building processes may vary depending on your location. This is a 15 by 24 garage between a single and double car. Due to the land, terrain and budget, this is the best suitable option for us. My mom and I will be building this garage together. The only work we had subcontracted out was the concrete floor. First was drafting up the plans for the garage. With the garage being closer to the road than the house, we needed an extra approval through the municipality. An application was submitted along with a paid fee. Then we had one month to wait for the committee gathering where our plans were presented and this was then voted upon. Once accepted, then the full plans were submitted for a building permit. The building permit required for the full site plan, location of the septic system, existing building structures, setback and property lines, and full dimensions. The garage did need to meet with any setback and height requirements, and this information can be found on your municipality bylaw documents. Required drawings was the four elevations, pad layout, floor plan, truss layout, and wall sections. To keep the cost down, this is a 2x4 construction on a floating pad. Not all areas will allow for a floating pad. Some areas will even have a maximum square footage, such as where we live. I will have these plans available for free on my website eventually, and a link to them will be included in the video description. While we were waiting for the approvals, we started with the excavation of the area. Being sand, this was fairly easy to dig by hand, despite running into roots. The first step was stripping the grass back from the area. This was taken into the local dump and disposed of. This can be easily done with a shovel. After that, we stripped back the soil to keep it for future use as we're redoing some of the yard. Next was using a wheelbarrow to take the sand out of the area. Now you may be asking yourself why we didn't use a machine. With the septic system in the backyard, we didn't want to risk any damage to the system with any heavy equipment. We have a fairly hilly yard and wanted to level out a section past the septic area along with replacing some of the gravelly soil in some areas. In the backyard, we backfilled about 12 to 16 inches, so this not only saved money for us purchasing sand to backfill the yard, but we also didn't have to pay to truck out any sand. In our area, they typically charge about $600 for removal of dirt per dump truck load, and this doesn't include any hourly rates for digging equipment. To purchase a dump truck load of sand, this costs about $800. In our spare time and working around the rain, this took about a month to dig, but can be easily done in under two weeks working at it every day. We've already had the concrete contractor mark out the location of the pad as shown by the orange paint on the ground. The sloped terrain in reference with the house and driveway, the floor height of the garage will sit about 20 inches higher than the house. Having it too low may risk having water pooling on the pad, either coming in from the driveway or side yard. In order to level out the area, a base point was taken from the driveway wood ties. This will be the top of the floor pad. 5 inches was then subtracted from the base point. This will be the bottom of the pad. The garage floor is 5 inches thick. A laser level is used here. This can be set up with different accuracy ratings. I believe this one is within a quarter inch. The base soil must be undisturbed, otherwise this will create an unstable foundation which would result in the structure shifting. The area closer to the laser, this is the house side, the grade does drop and it's not ideal to raise this area with any dirt. So the pad will be slightly thicker on this side and to account for any potential risk of washout, this is where the integral footing will be substantially thicker than compared to the rest of the pad. This has been shown on the drawings. On the house side, the footing will be 20 inches thick. There is a transition on the front and rear, then the rest of the footing is 14 inches thick. A retaining wall was intended to be installed before the pad was put into place, but we were running into some problems with contractors. We had originally planned on using armor rock and did have a contractor lined up to do the floor and wall. At first we had problems with them calling back. Finally, when they did, apparently the order was placed and it was to be done a week later. We heard nothing after a week, waited another week, then tried to find another contractor. Pricing went from $3,500 to $20,000. The area was ready and just needed the rock to be put into place along with a filter cloth. 
apparently there was a supply shortage due to the cold weather, I did call a local quarry, and the price for the rock was about $2,500 delivered. However, obtaining the equipment for such a job isn't as easy, so instead we decided on another route which doesn't depend on the contractor. We'll most likely go with a timber and core 10 wall construction, and this can be done with a garage in place. Next, the contractor came in to lay out the forms and dig the footings. Here's a quick view when the guys took off for lunch. The forms are framed up using 2x12s. The footings and the pad will be done in one pour. This is known as an integral footing, where the slab on grade is done with a thicker perimeter edge. With the small square footage of this garage, this is allowable by the building code. This can also be done in one pour. The contractor is able to do this with one truck so it minimizes the risk of damaging the road or surrounding properties. Once they were done for the day, the pour was intended to be the next morning, but that wasn't without any issues. This is only part way through. Here you can see the difference in the footing size. We did notice some issues with the footing dimensions along with the floor thickness. The footing was to be 14 by 14 around the three sides, yet it was as narrow as 9 inches in some spots and only 10 inches thick at best in others. As for the 14 by 20 footing, well that was only 12 inches in depth. The floor was also supposed to be specked out as 5 inches thick. There was spots where the floor was only 3 inches thick instead. With the previous experience from other contractors, we just went ahead and fixed the issues ourselves. The concrete truck was scheduled to come first thing in the morning, so there would be a good chance this wouldn't have been fixed once the pad was poured. So, we would be stuck with the issues. With that being said, don't be afraid to double check someone's work, regardless of how many years of experience they have or how much of a professional they appear to be. This took a few hours to fix, running a string across the already leveled forms to ensure proper pad thickness, along with the proper width and depth of the footings. Sand was also added to the outside of the forms to keep them in place during the pour to prevent any run out from the bottom or flexing of the forms. No gravel was used under the pad or footings as sand makes a great base and it's the preferred choice around here. Before the pour, the sand was watered and a compactor was used. Again, the sand base is undisturbed ground. Just before the concrete came, two rows of half inch rebar were laid out on the integral footing. This will be installed part way through the pour. Metal rods are also placed in the center to ensure the proper thickness and level. The pad is not sloped it will sit 5 inches above finished grade. A string was ran around the perimeter of the footings to check for straightness, and a wire mesh was used in the pad to add some reinforcing. As mentioned earlier, the pad will be 5 inches thick, which is 1 inch thicker than what is called for by the building code, improving its strength. With the cooler weather, the pad will set up much slower, so an accelerator is needed. Calcium chloride can be used to increase the setup time and it's the cheapest additive, but not all building codes allow for it and it can especially be a problem with reinforcing within the pad as it can cause rot. We specifically requested not to use calcium and went for a slightly more expensive chemical additive instead. During the pour, despite providing the contractor with the drawings, he assumed it was a 2x6 construction instead of a 2x4 which affected the placement of the anchor bolts. This issue was caught in the right time, while contractors don't like to be kept an eye on, it's obviously needed to ensure things are correct. The floor was then power trialed for a lengthy time to give the extremely smooth finish as requested. Once the garage is finished, it'll have a burnished finish, which not only looks good, but can be easily kept clean, has some protection against stains, is cheaper than a good quality epoxy, and there's no chance of peeling like epoxy. The garage door entrance has also been tapered to provide water runoff when raining and it has an anti-slip finish. After a couple days the forms were then removed and they backfilled the pad almost to the top, which again was something we requested against. After cleaning up the groundwork we found excessive honeycombing on the side which was a great disappointment. This can be caused by a dry concrete mixture, meaning there's not enough water, the concrete is setting up too fast where it's too thick to work with, and the last reason is improper vibration of the forms where it helps pull out any air pockets. So again, there was more work for repairing the issues and I do have a video specifically for this. This particular contractor was highly recommended by many locals and had over 30 years experience. Even seeing photos of the contractor's previous work, we never expected all the issues on a simpler project. And while some may think that finding another contractor was an option, it was a chore just getting this one. We had people booked for estimates who never showed up, others after viewing the job never sent out an estimate, some weren't interested, or they wouldn't be able to do the job for at least six months. 
the price wasn't negotiated, and this wasn't the cheapest price. With some of the other projects we have, we were hoping to get the framing done before the snow fell, but now that we're in another lockdown, it's been tough trying to get any building material. There has also been a sharp increase in the cost of wood, which is something else we'll have to face. Currently, this has been one of the biggest snow loads we've had so far, and the big drop in temperature, framing hasn't been a priority at the moment. Be sure to keep an eye out for the next video, which will be covering the framing stage. If you found this video helpful, please don't forget to give it a like and drop a comment below. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more home DIY videos. Thank you for watching.